Third Maccabees chapter 1. When Philopater learned from those who returned that the regions that he had controlled had been seized by Antiochus, he gave orders to all his forces, both infantry and cavalry, took with him his sister Arsinoe, and marched out to the region near Raphia, where the army of Antiochus was encamped. But a certain Theodotus, determined to carry out the plot he had devised, took with him the best of the Ptolemaic arms that had been previously issued to him and crossed over by night to the tent of Ptolemy, intending single-handedly to kill him and thereby end the war. But Dositheus, known as the son of Dremelus, a Jew by birth who later changed his customs and abandoned the ancestral traditions, had led the king away and arranged that a certain insignificant man should sleep in the tent. And so it turned out that this man incurred the punishment meant for the king. A fierce battle ensued, and when matters were turning out rather in favor of Antiochus, Arsinoe went to the troops with wailing and tears, her locks all disheveled, and exhorted them to defend themselves and their children and wives bravely, promising to give them each two minas of gold if they won the battle. And so it came about that the enemy was routed in the action, and many captives also were taken. Now that he had foiled the plot, Ptolemy decided to visit the neighboring cities and encourage them. By doing this, and by endowing their sacred enclosures with gifts, he strengthened the morale of his subjects. Since the Jews had sent some of their council and elders to greet him, to bring him gifts of welcome, and to congratulate him on what had happened, he was all the more eager to visit them as soon as possible. After he had arrived in Jerusalem, he offered sacrifice to the supreme God, and made thank offerings, and did what was fitting for the place. Then, upon entering the place, and being impressed by its excellence and its beauty, he marveled at the good order of the temple and conceived a desire to enter the sanctuary. When they said that this was not permitted, because not even members of their own nation were allowed to enter, not even all of the priests, but only the high priest, who was preeminent over all, and he only once a year, the king was by no means persuaded. Even after the law had been read to him, he did not cease to maintain that he ought to enter, saying, Even if those men are deprived of this honor, I ought not to be. And he inquired why. When he entered every other temple, no one there had stopped him. And someone answered thoughtlessly that it was wrong to place any significance in that. But since this has happened, the king said, Why should not I at least enter, whether they wish it or not? Then the priests, in all their vestments, prostrated themselves and entreated the supreme God to aid in the present situation and to avert the violence of this evil design. And they filled the temple with cries and tears. Those who remained behind in the city were agitated and hurried out, supposing that something mysterious was occurring. Young women who had been secluded in their chambers rushed out with their mothers, sprinkled their hair with dust, and filled the streets with groans and lamentations. Those women who had recently been arrayed for marriage abandoned the bridal chambers, prepared for wedded union, and neglecting proper modesty, in a disorderly rush flocked together in the city. Mothers and nurses abandoned even newborn children here and there, some in houses and some in the streets, and without a backward look they crowded together at the Most High Temple. Various were the supplications of those gathered there because of what the king was profanely plotting. In addition, the bolder of the citizens would not tolerate the completion of his plans or the fulfillment of his intended purpose. They shouted to their compatriots to take arms and die courageously for the ancestral law and created a considerable disturbance in the place. And, being barely restrained by the old men and the elders, they resorted to the same posture of supplication as the others. Meanwhile, the crowd, as before, was engaged in prayer, while the elders near the king tried in various ways to change his arrogant mind from the plan that he had conceived. But he, in his arrogance, took heed of nothing and began now to approach. 
determined to bring the aforesaid plan to a conclusion. When those who were around him observed this, they turned, together with our people, to call upon him who has all power to defend them in the present trouble, and not to overlook this unlawful and haughty deed. The continuous, vehement, and concerted cry of the crowds resulted in an immense uproar, for it seemed that not only the people, but also the walls and the whole earth around echoed, because indeed all at that time preferred death to the profanation of the place. Third Maccabees chapter 2 Then the high priest Simon, facing the sanctuary, bending his knees, and extending his hands with calm dignity, prayed as follows, Lord, Lord, King of the heavens and sovereign of all creation, holy among the holy ones, the only ruler, almighty, give attention to us who are suffering grievously from an impious and profane man, puffed up in his audacity and power. For you, the creator of all things and the governor of all, are a just ruler, and you judge those who have done anything in insolence and arrogance. You destroyed those who in the past committed injustice, among whom were even giants and who trusted in their strength and boldness, whom you destroyed by bringing on them a boundless flood. You consumed with fire and sulfur the people of Sodom who acted arrogantly, who were notorious for their vices, and you made them an example to those who should come afterward. By inflicting many and varied punishments on the audacious Pharaoh who had enslaved your holy people Israel, you made known your sovereignty, thus you made known your great strength. And when he pursued them with chariots and a mass of troops, you overwhelmed him in the depths of the sea, but carried through safely those who had put their confidence in you, the ruler over the whole creation. And when they had seen the works of your hand, they praised you, the Almighty, you, O King, when you had created the boundless and immeasurable earth, chose this city and sanctified this place for your name, though you have no need of anything. And when you had glorified it by your magnificent manifestation, you made it a firm foundation for the glory of your great and honored name. And because you love the house of Israel, you promised that if we should have reverses and tribulation should overtake us, you would listen to our petition when we come to this place and pray. And indeed, you are faithful and true. And because oftentimes when our fathers were oppressed, you helped them in their humiliation and rescued them from great evils. See now, O holy King, that because of our many and great sins, we are crushed with suffering, subjected to our enemies and overtaken by helplessness. In our downfall, this audacious and profane man undertakes to violate the holy place on earth dedicated to your glorious name. For your dwelling is the heaven of heavens, unapproachable by human beings. But because you were pleased that your glory should dwell among your people, Israel, you sanctified this place. Do not punish us for the defilement committed by these men, or call us to account for this profanation. Otherwise, the transgressors will boast in their wrath and exult in the arrogance of their tongue, saying, We have trampled down the house of holiness, as the houses of the abominations are trampled down. Wipe away our sins and disperse our errors and reveal your mercy at this hour. Speedily let your mercies overtake us. Put praises in the mouths of those who are downcast and broken in spirit and give us peace. Thereupon God, who oversees all things, the first father of all, holy among the holy ones, having heard the lawful supplication, scourged him who had exalted himself in insolence and audacity. He shook him on this side and that as a reed is shaken by the wind, so that he lay helpless on the ground and, besides being paralyzed in his limbs, was unable even to speak, since he was ensnared by a righteous judgment. Then both friends and bodyguards, seeing the severe punishment that had overtaken him, and fearing that he would lose his life, quickly dragged him out, panic-stricken in their exceedingly great fear. 
After a while he recovered, and though he had been punished, he by no means repented, but went away uttering bitter threats. When he arrived in Egypt, he increased in his deeds of malice, abetted by the previously mentioned drinking companions and comrades who were strangers to everything just. He was not content with his uncounted licentious deeds, but even continued with such audacity that he established an evil reputation in the various localities. And many of his friends, intently observing the king's purpose, themselves also followed his will. He proposed to inflict public disgrace on the nation, and he set up a stone on the tower in the courtyard with this inscription, None of those who do not sacrifice shall enter their sanctuaries, and all Jews shall be subjected to a registration involving poll tax and to the status of slaves. Those who object to this are to be taken by force and put to death. Those who are registered are also to be branded on their bodies by fire with the ivy leaf symbol of Dionysus, and they shall also be reduced to their former limited status. In order that he might not appear to be an enemy of all, he inscribed below, but if any of them prefer to join those who have been initiated into the mysteries, they shall have equal citizenship with the Alexandrians. Now some, with an obvious abhorrence of the price to be exacted for maintaining the piety of their city, readily gave themselves up since they expected to enhance their reputation by their future association with the king. But the majority acted firmly with a courageous spirit and did not abandon their piety, and by paying money in exchange for life they boldly attempted to save themselves from the registration. They remained resolutely hopeful of obtaining help, and they abhorred those who separated themselves from them, considering them to be enemies of the nation and depriving them of common fellowship and mutual help. Third Maccabees chapter 3 When the impious king comprehended this situation, he became so infuriated that not only was he enraged against those Jews who lived in Alexandria, but was still more bitterly hostile toward those in the countryside, and he ordered that all should promptly be gathered into one place and put to death by the most cruel means. While these matters were being arranged, a hostile rumor was circulated against the people by some who conspired to do them ill, a pretext being given by a report that they hindered others from the observance of their customs. The Jews, however, continued to maintain goodwill and unswerving loyalty toward the dynasty, but because they worshipped God and conducted themselves by His law, they kept their separateness with respect to foods. For this reason they appeared hateful to some, but since they adorned their style of life with the good deeds of upright people, they were established in good repute with everyone. Nevertheless, foreigners paid no heed to the good conduct of the people, which was common talk among all. Instead, they gossiped about the differences in worship and foods, alleging that these people were loyal neither to the king nor to his authorities but were hostile and greatly opposed to his government, so it was no ordinary reproach that they attached to them. The Greeks in the city, though wronged in no way, when they saw an unexpected tumult around these people and the crowds that suddenly were forming, were not strong enough to help them, for they lived under tyranny. They did try to console them, being grieved at the situation and expected that matters would change, for such a great community ought not to be left to its fate when it had committed no offense. And already some of their neighbors and friends and business associates had taken some of them aside privately and were pledging to protect them and to do everything in their power to help. Then the king, boastful of his present good fortune and not considering the might of the supreme God, but assuming that he would persevere constantly in his same purpose, wrote this letter against them. King Ptolemy Philopater to his generals and soldiers in Egypt and all its districts, greetings and good health. I myself and our government are faring well. When our expedition took place in Asia, as you yourselves know, it was brought to conclusion 
according to plan, by the God's deliberate alliance with us in battle, and we considered that we should not rule the nations inhabiting Coelisaria and Phoenicia by the power of the spear, but should cherish them with clemency and great benevolence, gladly treating them well. And when we had granted very great revenues to the temples in the cities, we came on to Jerusalem also and went up to honor the temple of those wicked people, who never cease from their folly. They accepted our presence by word, but insincerely by deed, because when we proposed to enter their inner temple and honor it with magnificent and most beautiful offerings, they were carried away by their traditional arrogance and excluded us from entering. But they were spared the exercise of our power because of the benevolence that we have toward all. By maintaining their manifest ill will toward us, they become the only people among all nations who hold their heads high in defiance of kings and their own benefactors, and are unwilling to regard any action as sincere. But we, when we arrived in Egypt victorious, accommodated ourselves to their folly and did as was proper, since we treat all nations with benevolence. Among other things, we made known to all our amnesty toward their compatriots here, both because of their alliance with us and the myriad affairs liberally entrusted to them from the beginning, and we ventured to make a change by deciding both to deem them worthy of Alexandrian citizenship and to make them participants in our regular religious rites. But in their innate malice, they took this in a contrary spirit and disdained what is good, since they incline constantly to evil. They not only spurn the priceless citizenship, but also both by speech and by silence they abhor those few among them who are sincerely disposed toward us. In every situation, in accordance with their infamous way of life, they secretly suspect that we may soon alter our policy. Therefore, fully convinced by these indications that they are ill-disposed toward us in every way, we have taken precautions so that, If a sudden disorder later arises against us, we shall not have these impious people behind our backs as traitors and barbarous enemies. Therefore, we have given orders that, as soon as this letter arrives, you are to send to us those who live among you, together with their wives and children, with insulting and harsh treatment and bound securely with iron fetters, to suffer the sure and shameful death that befits enemies." For when all of these have been punished, we are sure that for the remaining time the government will be established for ourselves in good order and in the best state. But those who shelter any of the Jews, whether old people or children or even infants, will be tortured to death with the most hateful torments, together with their families. Any who are willing to give information will receive the property of those who incur the punishment and also 2,000 drachmas from the royal treasury, and will be awarded their freedom. Every place detected sheltering a Jew is to be made unapproachable and burned with fire, and shall become useless for all time to any mortal creature. The letter was written in the above form. Third Maccabees chapter 4 In every place, then, where this decree arrived, A feast at public expense was arranged for the nations with shouts and gladness. For the inveterate enmity that had long ago been in their minds was now made evident and outspoken. But among the Jews there was indescribable mourning, lamentation, and tearful cries and groans. Everywhere their hearts were burning, and they groaned because of the unexpected destruction that had suddenly been decreed for them. What district or city, or what habitable place at all, or what streets were not filled with mourning and wailing for them? For with such a harsh and ruthless spirit were they being sent off, altogether, by the generals in every city, that at the sight of their unusual punishments, even some of their enemies, perceiving the common object of pity before their eyes, reflected on the uncertainty of life and shed tears at the most miserable expulsion of these people. For a multitude of gray-headed old men, sluggish and bent with age, was being led away, 
forced to march at a swift pace by the violence with which they were driven in such a shameful manner, and young women who had just entered the bridal chamber to share married life exchanged joy for welling, their myrrh-perfumed hair sprinkled with ashes, and were carried away unveiled, altogether raising a lament instead of a wedding song, as they were torn by the harsh treatment of foreign nations. In bonds and in public view they were violently dragged along as far as the place of embarkation, their husbands in the prime of youth, their necks encircled with ropes instead of garlands, spent the remaining days of their marriage festival in lamentations instead of feasting and youthful revelry, seeing Hades already lying at their feet. They were brought on board like wild animals, driven under the constraint of iron bonds. Some were fastened by the neck to the benches of the boats. Others had their feet secured by unbreakable fetters, and in addition they were confined under a solid deck, so that, with their eyes in total darkness, they would undergo treatment befitting traitors during the whole voyage. When these people had been brought to the place called Shadia, and the voyage was concluded as the king had decreed, he commanded that they should be enclosed in the hippodrome that had been built with an immense perimeter wall in front of the city, and that was well suited to make them an obvious spectacle to all coming back into the city and to those from the city going out into the country, so that they could neither communicate with the king's forces nor in any way claim to be inside the circuit of the city. And when this had happened, the king hearing that the Jews' compatriots from the city frequently went out in secret to lament bitterly the ignoble misfortune of their kindred, ordered in his rage that these people be dealt with in precisely the same fashion as the others, not omitting any detail of their punishment. The entire people was to be registered individually, not for the hard labor that has been briefly mentioned before, but to be tortured with the outrages that he had ordered and at the end to be destroyed in the space of a single day. The registration of these people was therefore conducted with bitter haste and zealous intensity from the rising of the sun until its setting, coming to an end after forty days, but still not completed. The king was greatly and continually filled with joy, organizing banquets in honor of all his idols, with a mind alienated from truth and with a profane mouth praising speechless things that are not able even to communicate or to come to one's help and uttering improper words against the supreme God. But after the previously mentioned interval of time, the scribes declared to the king that they were no longer able to take the census of the Jews because of their immense number, though most of them were still in the country, some still residing in their homes, and some at the place. The task was impossible for all the generals in Egypt. After he had threatened them severely, charging that they had been bribed to contrive a means of escape, he was clearly convinced about the matter when they said and proved that both the papyrus and the reeds they used for writing had already given out. But this was an act of the invincible providence of him who was aiding the Jews from heaven. Third Maccabees chapter 5 then the king, completely inflexible, was filled with overpowering anger and wrath. So he summoned Hermon, keeper of the elephants, and ordered him on the following day to drug all the elephants, five hundred in number, with large handfuls of frankincense and plenty of unmixed wine, and to drive them in, maddened by the lavish abundance of drink, so that the Jews might meet their doom. When he had given these orders, he returned to his feasting, together with those of his friends and of the army who were especially hostile toward the Jews. And Hermon, keeper of the elephants, proceeded faithfully to carry out the orders. The officials in charge of the Jews went out in the evening and bound the hands of the wretched people and arranged for their continued custody through the night, convinced that the whole people would experience its final destruction. For to the nations it appeared that the Jews were left without any aid, because in their bonds they were forcibly confined on every side, 
but with tears and a voice hard to silence, they all called upon the Almighty Lord and Ruler of all power, their merciful God and Father, praying that he avert the evil plot against them and in a glorious manifestation rescue them from the fate now prepared for them. So their entreaty ascended fervently to heaven. Herman, however, when he had drugged the pitiless elephants until they had been filled with a great abundance of wine and satiated with frankincense, presented himself at court early in the morning to report to the king about these preparations. But the Lord sent upon the king a portion of sleep, that beneficence that from the beginning, night and day, is bestowed by him who grants it to whomever he wishes. And by the action of the Lord, he was overcome by so pleasant and deep a sleep that he quite failed in his lawless purpose and was completely frustrated in his inflexible plan. Then the Jews, since they had escaped the appointed hour, praised their holy God and again implored him who is easily reconciled to show the might of his all-powerful hand to the arrogant nations. But now, since it was nearly the middle of the tenth hour, the person in charge of the invitations, seeing that the guests were assembled, approached the king and nudged him. And when he had with difficulty roused him, he pointed out that the hour of the banquet was already slipping by, and he gave him an account of the situation. The king, after considering this, returned to his drinking and ordered those present for the banquet to recline opposite him. When this was done, he urged them to give themselves over to feasting and to make the present portion of the banquet joyful by celebrating all the more. After the party had been going on for some time, the king summoned Hermon and with bitter threats demanded to know why the Jews had been allowed to remain alive through the present day. But when he, with the corroboration of the king's friends, pointed out that while it was still night, he had carried out completely the order given him, the king, possessed by a savagery worse than that of Phalerus, said that the Jews were benefited by today's sleep. But, he added, tomorrow, without delay, prepare the elephants in the same way for the destruction of the lawless Jews. When the king had spoken, all those present readily and joyfully with one accord gave their approval, and all went to their own homes. But that they did not so much spend the duration of the night in sleep as in devising all sorts of insults for those they thought to be doomed. Then, as soon as the cock had crowed in the early morning, Herman, having equipped the animals, began to move them along in the great colonnade. The crowds of the city had been assembled for this most pitiful spectacle and were eagerly waiting for daybreak. But the Jews, being at that very moment at their last gasp, stretched their hands toward heaven and with most tearful supplication and mournful dirges implored the Supreme God to help them again at once. The rays of the sun were not yet shed abroad, and while the king was receiving his friends, Hermon arrived and invited him to come out indicating that what the king desired was ready for action. But he, on receiving the report and being struck by the unusual invitation to come out, since he had been completely overcome by incomprehension, inquired what the matter was for which this had been so zealously completed for him. This was the act of God who rules over all things, for he had implanted in the king's mind a forgetfulness of the things he had previously devised. Then Hermon and all the king's friends pointed out that the animals and the armed forces were ready. O oh, king, according to your eager purpose. But at these words he was filled with an overpowering wrath, because by the providence of God his whole mind had been deranged concerning these matters. And with a threatening look he said, if your parents or children were present, I would have prepared them to be a rich feast for the savage animals instead of the Jews, who give me no ground for complaint and have exhibited a, to an extraordinary degree a full and firm loyalty to my ancestors. In fact, you would have been deprived of life instead of these, were it not for the affection arising from our common upbringing and lifelong association. 
So Herman suffered an unexpected and dangerous threat, and his eyes wavered and his face fell. The friends, one by one, sullenly slipped away and dismissed the assembled people to their own occupations. Then the Jews, on hearing what the king had said, praised the manifest Lord God, King of kings, since this also was his aid that they had received. The king, however, reconvened the banquet in the same manner and urged the guests to return to their celebrating. After summoning Herman, he said in a threatening tone, How many times, you wretched man, must I give you orders about these things? Equip the elephants now once more for the destruction of the Jews tomorrow. But the kinsmen who were at table with him, wondering at his instability of mind, remonstrated as follows, O king, how long will you put us to the test, as though we are idiots? ordering now for a third time that they be destroyed and again revoking your decree in the matter. As a result, the city is in a tumult because of its expectation. It is crowded with mobs of people and also in constant danger of being plundered. At this, the king, a phalaris in everything and filled with madness, took no account of the changes of mind that had come about within him for the protection of the Jews and he firmly swore an irrevocable oath that he would send them to Hades without delay, mangled by the knees and feet of the animals, and would also march against Judea and rapidly level it to the ground with fire and spear, and by burning to the ground the temple inaccessible to him would quickly render it forever empty of those who offered sacrifices there. Then the friends and kinsmen departed with great joy, and they confidently posted the armed forces at the places in the city most favorable for keeping guard. Now when the animals had been brought virtually to a state of madness, so to speak, by the very fragrant draughts of wine mixed with frankincense, and had been equipped with frightful devices, the elephant keeper entered the court around dawn, the city now being filled with countless masses of people crowding their way into the hippodrome and urged the king on to the matter at hand. So he, when he had filled his impious mind with a deep rage, rushed out in full force along with the animals, wishing to witness, with invulnerable heart and with his own eyes, the grievous and pitiful destruction of the aforementioned people. When the Jews saw the dust raised by the elephants going out at the gate, and by the following armed forces, as well as by the trampling of the crowd, and heard the loud and tumultuous noise, they thought this was their last moment of life, the end of their most miserable suspense. And giving way to lamentation and groans, they kissed each other, embracing relatives, and falling into one another's arms, parents and children, mothers and daughters, and others with babies at their breasts who were drawing their last milk. Nevertheless, when they considered the help that they had received before from heaven, they prostrated themselves with one accord on the ground, removing the babies from their breasts, and cried out in a very loud voice, imploring the ruler over every power to manifest himself and be merciful to them, as they stood now at the gates of Hades. Chapter 2